All right. So again, technical difficulties again. Hopefully we'll have them solved. Come to find out the problem is with my fairly new, fairly expensive laptop. Uh, so we'll get that repaired. Anyway, I think we will created a workaround so that we can get all of this uh, uh, in and get the information to you. So uh, a little bit after, let's jump right in. All right. So here we are. Uh, this is lecture number eight. This is the advanced shoulder. Um, in this, we're going to look at uh, quite a bit of, of content, and I hope I can keep this at the proper time frame. Um, anytime dealing with the shoulder, obviously, there's other areas that we have to take into consideration. We're going to look at the anterior torso. Again, pec major, minor, subclavius. Um, I include rectus abdominis and the transverse internal and external obliques. Uh, our core control is necessary for any of our, our, our arm and shoulder movements. Uh, we'll jump into the CT junction here, latissimus, serratus, trapezius, levator, rhomboids, and serratus posterior superior. Uh, you, so as, as you look at interior and the CT junction, obviously that's the scapular component. Hard to get any result out of that shoulder if you're not looking at uh, scapular control. At the end, we'll look at some scapular protocols as well for some common things that we can see out there. And then we'll jump into the shoulder itself, both the muscle of the deltoid and then uh, the rotator cuff muscles, uh, supra, infra, teres minor and major, and then subscap. Uh, we'll go further and look at the upper arm. Obviously, the muscles of the upper arm are going to have an impact on how the shoulder moves and behaves. Uh, issues with the muscles of the upper arm because of their uh, attachment into the shoulder can create issues that we have to take care of. Uh, here, corico, uh, biceps, uh, brachialis, triceps, and then brachioradialis. We'll jump down into the tendons and the ligaments. So here, uh, the AC joint, uh, the coracoacromial ligament, trapezoid, coracohumeral, conoid, has some bursts of, of importance, the subdeltoid bursts or the subacromial, and some new content I've added just uh, for uh, this hybrid component, the subtendinous bursa of infraspinatus, the coracobrachial bursa, the subtendinous bursa of subscap, and then the glenoid labrum. Uh, for our radi uh, regional and diagnosis protocols, we'll look at AC, SC joint, uh, just general rotator cuff itself. Uh, we'll look specifically at uh, the tendonitis, tendinosis that we get with the rotator cuff. Uh, we'll look at bicipital ten tendonitis, both origin and insertion. Uh, we'll look at the subdeltoid subacromial bursitis, or more commonly termed impingement. Uh, we'll look at that intertubercular tenosynovitis. Then on for our scapular pieces, We'll look at the six scapular or our scapular dyskinesis. We'll look at snapping scapula and we'll look at the winged scapula. Then finally, we'll take a look at our perineural protocols. And here we're just going to deal with one and it's going to be the supraclavicular nerves. Uh, a little bit of some supporting evidence study here by Halley. Uh, their purpose uh, to determine if the addition of upper quarter dry needling to a rehab protocol if it's more efficient, more effective in improving range of motion, pain, and so forth. Uh, their study, uh, they showed that the significant difference in flexion at the six-month follow-up may be explained by additional time spent receiving passive range of motion in the control group. So their control group um, did not receive dry needling, but instead of that same time frame, they received more range of motion. Well, unfortunately, that kind of skews the study in and of itself. Uh, they didn't show any difference significant difference, uh, but they had different treatment protocols. So uh, while interesting to see, um, uh, it did provide, uh, what it did do is uh, some, that, uh, some evidence that dry needling in a post-surgical population is safe and without significant risk of atrogenic infection or other adverse events. Um, another one by uh, uh, James Dunning. Uh, here, their objectives uh, to compare effects of spinal thrust manipulation and electrical dry needling. Uh, compared to just uh, joint mobilization, exercise, and interferential current. Uh, here, and this is a study that they've uh, reproduced uh, two or three different times looking at different variables. Uh, each time they do find that including upper rib thrust manipulation uh, is along with uh, electrical dry needling or dry needling with electrical stem attached, uh, did result in greater reductions in pain disability and medication intake than the non-thrust. Uh, so while it's a great to look at the combination of uh, HVLAT and dry needling, it doesn't give us a great idea about uh, one or the other individually. 
Uh, there are some people that uh, need and can benefit from both. Uh, but really what we want to know is individually, what do they what do they do? Uh, that being said, very frequently we will find that we are grouping these two together, whether it's an aggressive mobilization or whether if you're trained uh, high velocity uh, through that uh, glenohumeral joint or, or any of the other joints, in this case, uh, the upper rib. Uh, here is a review by Stoichev. Um, here, wanted to look at dry needling as a treatment modality for tendinopathy. Uh, what they looked at was the wrist, common extensor origin, um, the patellar tendon, rotator cuff, tendons around the greater trochanter. Um, and what they found was that it did provide some initial support for the efficacy of dry needling for tendinopathy treatment. It is, I, I, anecdotally, I can tell you, I treat uh, tendon issues and ligament issues for that matter very frequently with dry needling. We get that response. We get that, that healing uh, stimulated by insertion of the needle into that, uh, those structures that are, are, are inflamed, and we do tend to see that. So just one piece of research that, that, that supports that. Not the highest level of evidence, but uh, certainly uh, gives us a little bit. And this was back February 2020. Another uh, from, from Cray, uh, here the objective was to summarize the best available evidence to, to determine if tendon needle is a, an effective treatment for tendinopathy. Again, same, same approach. Here they're looking at uh, the elbow for lateral epicondylitis, also the Achilles tendon, and in the rotator cuff. And then here they also concluded that um, evidence suggests that tendon needling does improve patient-reported outcome measures in patients with that tendinopathy. And this was through... Um, uh, looking at uh, the data through um, Medline and the Cochrane database. Uh, so, and, and again, it was a systematic review. So some high level there. Um, another um, from Weiss uh, here, rot uh, purpose, uh, rotator cuff injuries, common cause of pain, dysfunction in the elite athlete. and can result in lot time loss from participation. Um, and it's just a review of uh, current management and those injuries. Here, we did see that dry needling did demonstrate early promising results. Uh, wasn't as inclusive as it could have been, but uh, again, a little bit higher level of, um, of research to give us this information. So uh, we have a lot more to get through uh, as far as research, a lot more that we need to do, but slowly but surely, we're going to get there. Um, so we want to jump to our, our 3D kinetic screen, our 3KS for the cervical thoracic lumbar and the shoulder, now, I, didn't, I need to take update this and the video. Video is updated. Uh, so uh, as we've done previously, we're going to go through each of these motions. You can just jump to the shoulder piece as well, but it's a good idea to get in the routine of doing all of them at the same time. So I'm going to attempt now. To come here. All right, so. We, we've watched through this, and this, this is a full assessment or a full demonstration of the entire uh, 3D kinetic screen. I'm just going to stop it uh, once we get to the shoulder. Uh, if you recall, we start with the cervical, the, the, the linear motion, flexion and extension. We'll do that five times. We're going to move forward for time's sake. Then we'll do our diagonal rotation of looking down at the armpit, looking back over the right shoulder. We'll do that on that side five times, and then we'll do the opposite. Again, from the armpit up and back over the left shoulder. Obviously, cervical range of motion, cervical pathology can frequently have an issue when it comes to uh, problems related to the shoulder. So assessing cervical range of motion, very important. Likewise, trunk rotation can have an impact if you see a disparity of movement, an asymmetry of uh, rotating left versus right, uh, it can be a, uh, an indicator of some potential involvement as far as a movement system of the involved shoulder. In this case, you can tell rotating to her left is not as complete as rotating to the right. It's not terrible, but there's a, there are times where it's uh, a little diminished. So we'll do the trunk uh, five times. We'll do the lumbar linear motion. Never hurts to do that for a shoulder issue, just to get a full sense uh, for the sake of time. Let her go through that and go through her lumbar diagonal. And on the other side. 
And we also have, and we'll get to this when we get to the hip, um, a figure four sitting for our purpose of the shoulder. I'm not too concerned about that. Uh, the, the figure four sitting is just a one repetition per side. It's either you can do it well without assistance, without changing your form, or you cannot. It's a pass fail. And so here we'll take a look at our shoulder specific pieces. So we wanna look at our shoulder posterior um, internal rotation. And what we wanna do is we wanna find out what is our height? Uh, how, how high can we get back there? We wanna compare one side versus the other. And obviously you can tell I marked uh, her right. Her left is definitely a little bit higher than the right. So that's the asymmetry that we're looking for. Okay, and that's just one time. Then we'll look at the posterior external rotation. So I'm gonna mark uh, the location of how far she can reach down on the right. And then we'll duplicate it there on the left. Again, just looking for asymmetry. And so that one is actually about the same. So, so nothing terrible that we see there. All right, so let's move from there and let's come back. All right, so. Now onto our structures, our, our muscular pieces on the anterior tor torso. I know we've al already covered uh, a good bit of this, if not all of this in the um, th advanced thoracic spine. Uh, we might just cover them briefly. Uh, I will end up taking another look at um, uh, our, our three-dimensional anatomy uh, just, just as a review. Uh, so, um, Instead of going through this here, I'm going to skip through these pieces that we've already covered, and I'm going to jump down to, I should come to the 3D anatomy. All right, our anterior torso. So let's go to that program. All right, anterior torso. So we'll bring these things up and I'm actually going to cut me out of that so we can see everything. So the anterior torso, uh, here obviously uh, pectoralis major, pectoralis minor sitting behind because it does have the attachment onto, so pec major attaches onto the humerus, pec minor onto the coracoid, uh, they are gonna have some influence over uh, the movement of the, of, the, of the humerus and the movement stabilization of the scapula. Uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier, we'll, we're including um, rectus abdominis, transversus abdominis, internal, external oblique, uh, quite honestly, not because it has a direct relationship to shoulder movement, but stabilizing the trunk is necessary in order to get the movements that we're looking for uh, with, with movement of that shoulder. If we don't have that good, good postural, good trunk control, go to, go to elevate the, the arm, we are going to see some shifts and changes. Uh, so always a good idea to evaluate that piece as well. Um, here on the right side of our um, model, we can also see uh, subclavius um, coming off of the first rib over to the clavicle, drop that down a little bit, uh, its relevance in creating issues. Um, it, it, it's rarely clinically involved from what I have seen. Uh, there are times where that is our biggest point of pain. Uh, it's isolated, so right there. It's usually not associated with um, not knowingly associated with, with the shoulder itself. Uh, it's usually just an odd pain that they, that a patient will see whenever something's going on. Uh, but because it, it does articulate or attach onto the structures, good, good to know, good to be able to manage that. Uh, let's see, anterior torso, um, the rest of this will go on to posterior. So again, just, just some supplementary things to look at that, that you may need to consider treating whenever you are uh, dealing with the shoulder issue. So let's come back. Uh, oh, that was the wrong one. I'll get myself coordinated momentarily. All right, let's move from there. I know it's here. Let's try it there.
it is not there. Well, well, ah, there we are. Okay. So for treatment, PEG major, again, I'm not going to spend tons of time here because we've already covered this, but just as a review uh, for, for treatment of PEG major, uh, we're going to grasp that muscle out on the lateral aspect, uh, usually in the supine uh, position and, and needle through it there closer to the axilla. Um, and let's see if we can do this. I will... I don't need a pole. Let's go ahead and come out to our videos. Let's let's go ahead and briefly run through these. All right. And just going to reach in there, grasp that muscle belly, and going to have to get down into the business in the axilla, and then needle using your fingers for the backdrop. So we'll catch pec major there. Okay. Well, so instead of going through the, the description here, I'm going to fast forward down to the actual needling part. We've already done um, this. So pec minor, we've got a couple of Actually, technically, there's three ways that we can do this. Uh, you can do it off of the, uh, the midline attachment on ribs three, four, and five if the patient is thin and you can identify that. And ideally, if there's no breast tissue uh, of concern. Uh, more often, we're going to do it either getting deep into that axilla to, to approximate that pec minor and then needle across it from upper uh, superior to inferior and lateral. Um, and then lastly, it can be a needle off the medial aspect of the coracoid process where the peg minor comes to attach right there. So let's look at those. So here we're gonna dig deep into that axilla. You have to go a significant amount further than with peg major. And then you're gonna go from superior medial, thread across that, that muscle as it's attaching to the tendon, to inferior lateral. Likewise, you can come in onto the coracoid process and we're just gonna drop off the medial aspect there of that coracoid. Um, the, 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 the muscle itself lines right here and attaches to that medial aspect. So just drop anterior to posterior for that. Okay, for subclavius, let's move on. So with subclavius, given its location, uh, we are going to basically use a budding technique. So we're going to needle onto um, the clavicle right here. And we're going to drop inferiorly or just a little bit so that we can needle in a superior angle to still land on the, the clavicle itself. A big caution here for the lung field, obviously. So if you go more than a centimeter through the skin, centimeter and a half at most, uh, you know that you've missed your target. I would rather... I would rather miss my target here than to go too inferior to that clavicle and result in the, in, in the um, lung field. So we'll find a midpoint. I'm going to splay the fingers. We're going to needle a little bit superiorly here onto the clavicle. And then we can shift a little bit inferiorly, just a redirection to that undersurface of the clavicle. So we'll look at rectus abdominis, uh, a couple of locations we can needle rectus abdominis uh, in the superior aspect. So here is our um, chondral junction. Uh, the rectus uh, does come up and attaches here. So we can always catch this right here. On the rectus abdominis, it's important to note that there is a, there is a firm yet non-solid backdrop 
Uh, so when needling that, be very cautious of your needle depth. You should feel a soft barrier as you're dropping the needle there. Um, after a, depending, again, depending on patient habitus, maybe centimeter, centimeter and a half would be our, my, my deepest uh, depth on that. Uh, and then we'll also do it a further inferiorly. So again, palpating xiphoid process, gonna drop down, finger breadth, two finger breadths lateral, and we're gonna take this and sort of a, a fairly oblique angle. Uh, so we're looking down inferiorly, coming above uh, the umbilicus. Again, here you can see that oblique nature of that uh, insertion quite well. Needle is being a little stubborn, trying to go in. Uh, again, in this situation, be aware of the depth of your needle. Uh, again, there is that soft backdrop to it, but you don't want to go through that into the abdominal content. And then we move into the, uh, the transverse abdominus, external obliques, internal obliques. And here we take that in a sideline position so that we can effectively needle into that. So in this position, as you can tell, this is a fairly uh, thin subject. I've had to place a towel roll underneath the mat side um, in her waist so that we can elevate and separate that rib cage from the iliac uh, crest. Um, so uh, our needle location will, will be just threading through those three muscles right there. Palpate for the distance, that space in between, just using um, a grip to get through. You don't want to be too far to, toward the mat. Uh, so that you don't end up through the um, into the stomach contents, uh, but that is a great way to get uh, some needling there. All right, so I'm going to jump out of that. I'm going to come back to our presentation here, if I can locate it. Multiple screens gets confusing at times. Okay, so we've been now through um, the, the previous musculature that are supporting uh, anterior torso um, muscles. Now we'll move on to our, our CT junction. Here we'll look at the, the lats, serratus anterior, um, all three of the trapezius, the levator scap, the rhomboids, and then the serratus posterior superior. Yeah, we've already gone through this in the advanced thoracic, uh, so I will just jump quickly to the, the 3D anatomy piece. While I am here, however, let me go ahead and get my thing move forward. All right, again, I don't need a pull. All right, so 3D anatomy. So let's come back to our library. Okay, so our CT junction, let me bring that up. All right, so here on the posterior aspect, again, we look at the muscles that move, um, move or stabilize the scapula. Uh, the trapezius, obviously, uh, all three pieces of the trapezius have an insertion onto this, uh, under the scapula, so obviously a big mover. They also move the upper trap onto uh, the, the lateral third to half of the clavicles, so obviously can have big impact on how uh, that moves. Likewise, the latissimus, big player in the movement of the shoulder, especially in that, that downward stroking, that flexing uh, movement that we can do. On the deeper structures, now we, we definitely want to take a look at uh, rhomboid major, rhomboid minor, as they attach onto the uh, medial border of the scapula. Likewise, levator scapulae. Uh, with its uh, origin off of the superior angle, uh, and it comes up and attaches to uh, one, two, and three. Um, so common to have problems with this levator scap complaints of that upper um, close in uh, pain on that backside. Very common for that to be either the upper traps or, or more deeply, uh, if there's some movement of uh, problems involved, then it could be that levator. Uh, we also have the deeper serratus posterior superior, um, which has a little bit more to do with rib control than it does scapula, but it technically meets the definition. And then finally, looking at 
serratus anterior, obviously a uh, major stabilizer of, uh, of, of the scapula. Uh, so uh, we'll talk later about wing scapula, six scapula, um, and snapping scapula, very, very important for stabilization of that scapula. And as you know, if you are dealing with a shoulder problem, one of the first things you want to do is stabilize the scapula. So serratus anterior, a big player there. All right, let's jump and let's go back to taking a look at uh, the muscle. So let's jump down to treatment here on the latissimus. Similar to pec major, what we'll do here is, again, reach under, grasp that muscle belly inferior to the axilla, and then we're going to needle from a medial to lateral position to stay away from the, the rib cage. So looking a little bit closer, again, getting in the meat of that axilla, dropping down and advancing. Interestingly, with the latissimus, this is a very close approximation to needling location for teres major. It's also posterior deltoid can be closely, um, really, really close here. If we, this was probably a little too inferior for posterior delt, but um, very commonly when we stimulate that needle for lat, we do see that we get some other muscles involved. So straight is anterior, let's move to the treatment component. And so in this, so serratus anterior can have two treatment options. Uh, one, we go, as you can see, we go hand behind back. That will let that scapula wing out a little bit, kind of tilt uh, towards, uh, to give you that space. So we can kneel it on the anterior surface of the scapula. Or if it's a thinner person, we can identify the lateral uh, border of, uh, of the rib cage and where the muscle uh, has its origin. Then we can needle onto the rib cage itself. Extreme caution to avoid needling that if you can't absolutely with no uncertainty palpate the rib because we're going to use rib as a backdrop. So uh, more often than not, we're going to needle underneath uh, the, the scapula on that anterior surface. And interestingly, this is also the preferred method of needling subscapularis. <coughs> so frequently we find we have muscles with, um, when we get a twofer, we get two muscles with one single needle stick. That's definitely uh, a nice one so that you don't have to do that twice. Here is this lateral approach. So as you can tell, my fingers are uh, splaying along the path of the rib as it's coming around. And then I can needle, and it's almost um, in the in the midline of of the body. Uh, if we looked in that plane, uh, that would let us identify that. Again, if you're not able to palpate uh, the borders of the rib to definitely bracket those, then don't try needling there. Okay, and you can see I landed on rib for upper trap. I think I catch all the traps here, so. Just midway between uh, the neck and the lateral aspect, we're going to find that spot. There's usually one area that's got a little bit more bulk, a little bit more muscle tension. My fingers are on the anterior aspect so that I can approximate the fingers, know that I get through a lot of muscle tissue without coming through to the other side. Trapezius. Middle trapezius. Again, having covered that, we're going to come off spine of the scapula, and then we're going to thread through middle trapezius right in that area. As we get a closer view from, um, from up top, we can see that. Okay, so we're going to find that middle trapezius. We're going to bunch that tissue together, and then we're going to thread through it in a superior to inferior uh, trajectory. Again, using my fingers as a backdrop uh, to determine proper depth. And then lower trapezius, we will find that we... Similarly, at the inferior angle of the scapula, now we're going to do a similar, we're going to pinch and bunch that tissue together, and then we're going to thread through that. So inferior border, bunch the tissue together, and then coming from superior to inferior, we'll, we'll needle and thread straight through that tissue. That needle is being stubborn. All right.
So that's upper, middle, inferior. Okay. Levator. Again, we're going to go into a hand, hand behind back or a hammer lock position so that we get that superior angle of deflected away from the body a little bit. We do that because of the location of the lung field. We definitely don't want to end up in there, but that is a fairly superficial or a fairly small muscle, fairly deep to um, the skin right there. So we want to be as uh, certain as we can that we're going to get the structure that we want. So come there and then let you look at it from a, uh, an overhead position. So again, we got that hand behind back. So this really comes on levator scap. It, but for me, it's it's about position of the patient, position of myself, uh, inferior to superior. An angle uh, is one way of doing it. It can be done from superior to inferior as long as we grasp that tissue, bunch it up, uh, and have a nice angle, and, and being certain that we're not advancing that needle into the the lung field. All right, Ron Boyd Major. Again, hammerlock position so that we can get into those structures. We're going to take that needle into the, the aspect on that inferior, so inferior to the spine of the scapula. That's the bulk of our tissue. We're going to needle into it. Now, this is very similar to what we did for serratus anterior and subscapularis. However, here, my goal is not necessarily to needle through all of that tissue to land on the anterior aspect. What I would really like to do is land on the thin edge of that medial border of the scapula. Uh, so we do know that we can do that. Now, if we go through and land on the anterior surface, yes, we're still going to get a rhomboid uh, major. When we come up higher, we'll catch rhomboid minor. Uh, but to, to isolate them, I like to land right there. For the rhomboid minor, again, we'll be at the spine of the scapula to the superior uh, just superior to the spine of the scapula. So carrying it over, and we're going to go basically here to the root of the spine of the scapula. Again, I want to land on that the edge right there. Uh, that way I isolate that. And if I go further and hit anterior, I'm still catching rhomboid minor, but um, I'm catching the other uh, serratus subscap as well. But hitting that border lets me isolate those from the other two. For the serratus posterior superior. Serratus posterior superior, it's a superficial uh, insertion. Uh, clinically, probably not a big player, not a big game changer. But as a part of that scapular uh, group, I do want to be able to, to, to lo localize it right there. And so, again, I'm not looking for backdrop. I just want to go maybe a centimeter and a half, two centimeters into that muscle to isolate it. All right. So let's not jump ahead of ourselves. Still don't want to take a pull. All right. Let's jump back now to here. So we've just gone through the treatment at piece for, for the Posterior, we did the anterior torso. Now we did this, the, the CT junction uh, uh, treatment. Um, so I'm not going to read that to you again. But let's come down to now musculature of the shoulder. <clears throat> Here we'll look at uh, deltoid, infra, supra, teres minor, major, and then subscap. I include deltoid. Obviously, I'm not calling this the rotator cuff because I'm including deltoid and teres major. Uh, deltoid being a main mover uh, of, of the shoulder itself uh, with the, the rotator cuff being our, our stabilizing uh, mechanism. So for deltoid, and we will bring this over to, let's go ahead and go to our complete anatomy, our 3D anatomy, to look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, we have already looked at uh, the posterior deltoid. Uh, here we can go ahead and take a look at anterior and lateral. Um, infraspinatus we've looked at, teres minor and major we've looked at. Uh, subscap is, is going to be new. I'm sorry, supraspinatus. Um, 
I don't think we did that last time. We reserved that for uh, the advanced component here, as well as subscap. Subscap will have two different areas where you can needle that. So let's make another jump over to our anatomy. All right. So we'll start with the deltoid. I'll take a superior view here, superlateral view. So obviously the deltoid has uh, origin off of the, uh, the lateral part of the clavicle around onto the acromion and then down a good two thirds of the way down the spine of the scapula. So with that angle of uh, that location of origin, it can obviously pay, play a big role in both flexion, abduction and extension. And truly, although it's one muscle, it has to be it has to be accredited for for all three of those motions. Uh, it's attachment, then deltoid tubercle. Um, here, innervated by C five C six. So deltoid. Let's move over to this side. I'm going to remove the delt. I'm going to hide that puppy. All right, and let's come in. We'll start with supra. So supraspinatus sits in the supraspinous fossa. It inserts onto the, get that burst out of the way, on the superior facets of the greater, uh, greater trochanter, of the humerus. Um, and uh, its action, obviously, is abduction. Um, let me bring that back up. I don't know about that. It's also suprascapular nerve, C5, C6. It abducts and stabilizes, stabilizes the arm at the glenohumeral joint. Again, uh, its primary function is that stabilization, and it assists in a small degree with the actual abduction, especially those first uh, few 10 to 15 degrees. More After that, it's more about the deltoid. We drop into infraspinatus, which we've already covered. Again, it covers a broad area in uh, the infraspinous fossa. Uh, it attaches onto the medial or, or the middle facet uh, on, on the humerus. And it's um, also a suprascapular nerve, uh, C5, C6. Uh, it's, it's action, it's laterally or externally rotates, transversely abducts, and mainly it stabilizes the arm at the glenohumeral joint. Uh, so we frequently see in, in the infraspinatus um, a lot of overuse type work. Um, we're, we're a lot more tolerant to uh, internal rotation. Uh, it's just activities that we do more frequently. Uh, but So we tend to see a lot more muscle tension uh, from overuse in that infraspinatus. Obviously, supraspinatus is the, the muscle that if we're going to have a tear, more than likely that one is going to be involved, especially as is it, uh, is it jams into the acromion uh, or if we're prone to having uh, spurring uh, at the AC joint. Uh, so... Um, Super tends to be more injury prone, and then infra tends to respond or have bigger response to, to overuse. Uh, Terry's minor uh, here, um, so it, it, it inserts into the inferior facets of the um, greater tubercle. Uh, it laterally rotates, transversely abducts, and then stabilizes the arm, then a humeral joint. Uh, every so often, you will find that Terry's minor is involved in a movement function. There's going to be uh, some severe tenderness in that muscle. Uh, more often than not, you're not going to see it injured, uh, but do need to know that it could be involved so that we needle that if necessary. Then further down, Terry's major on the inferior half uh, or inferior third of the, of the scapula. Um, and it um, inserts into the crest of the lesser tubercle um, as it comes around more anteriorly. So obviously it has a um, uh, function for adduction, uh, medially rotation at the glenohumeral joint. Again, adduction is probably uh, its bigger function. Uh, because it's not on up higher, it doesn't really serve a role as far as stabilization. And finally, let's look anteriorly at subscap. So we look and we see um, its origin is on the subscapular fossa, 
of the scapula there on that anterior surface, and it inserts into the lesser tubercle of the humerus. So any of that anterior uh, compartment stuff, subscap, probably has some sort of a role into it. Uh, its innervation is the upper and lower subscapular nerves, C5, C6, C7, um, and its action medially rotating and stabilizing the arm at the glenohumeral joint. So that one definitely does play a role in stabilization. Um, as far ab and abduction, and abduction. So as far as the muscles of the shoulder, those are big players. So let's come back to where we sit here. So for our treatment, again, a lot of this we've already covered, uh, but we'll, as we get to the video, we will cover that in a little bit more detail. Um, lateral deltoid, anterior deltoid, um, I, I don't know as I mentioned it last time, we do wanna be cautious. The cephalic vein runs between anterior fibers of deltoid and, and pec major. So be cautious of that. Um, uh, hit that, odds are you'll end up with a nice little bruise that you'll have to explain to your patient. Um, so deltoid, let's, let's go ahead and jump straight to the treatment videos here. So again, here would be a, an area we would be uh, cautious of that anterior cephalic vein. You want to go a little bit further anterior or, or medial or lateral. And you can take, again, you can take that direct approach in using uh, the humerus as a backdrop, which we did there. Or you can take that threading approach. We get a little bit more superficial. Uh, and depending on how the patient responds, I may do a direct approach one time. And if I don't get the response that I'm looking for, uh, I will take a threading approach. With a threading approach, I'm going to get more surface area with the needle into the um, into that muscle itself. So that may be a better choice depending on the patient response. Again, we'll look at here the the lateral delt. Again, we can do a direct approach down to the humerus, or I can thread all the way through the muscle and get a little bit more um, surface area here. We're going to thread all the way through. That's going to give me my most amount of surface area into that tissue. On the direct, I can have a better approach to a specific focus of discomfort, but I'm not going to have as much surface area. So clinically, we just have to decide. And then taking a look at the posterior delt. Again, we can take a threading view, which I'm doing here. Just thread all the way through uh, the tissue of the, the posterior delt or we can take that direct approach and then down to the humerus as a backdrop. All right. Okay, so for supraspinatus, because it sits in the supraspinous fossa, what we wanna make certain of is that we don't end up with that needle going anterior to the, the anterior border of the scapula and, and ultimately end up in the rib cage. So as, as you start needling the supraspinatus, I'm gonna demonstrate to needle from superior to inferior onto the spine of the scapula. Once you hit the spine of the scapula, you're gonna retract the needle slightly. You're gonna use your, your fingers. You're gonna roll the skin superiorly and anteriorly so that that needle drops off of the spine of the scapula, and then you're going to direct that needle from a cranial aspect to a caudal aspect, almost with a posterior angulation. That guarantees that you don't land into the lung field. 
So I'm going to come in. I'm going to needle. I'm going to peck onto the spine of the scapula. I'm going to redirect and advance it posteriorly. From a bird's eye view, again, I'm going to locate spine of the scapula. I'm going to needle on, and I'm going to retract the skin. I'm going to needle down to the spine of the scapula. I'm going to release that skin, pushing it forward. Now I can needle superior anterior to inferior posterior. Guarantees we stay out of the lung field. All right, and for spinatus. Lots of good response from needling infraspinatus. Infraspinatus response is very similar to what we see in the upper trapezius. You usually see some really nice, really quick uh, improvement there. Here, what we're going to do is, we're, again, we're going to find the spine of the scapula. We're going to drop one finger breadth caudally from that, and then we're going to drop anterior, I'm sorry, posterior to anterior using the infraspinous fossa as a backdrop. like such. So I can't mark it on here, but we're, we're aware. So spine of the scapula comes here. Uh, the, the scapula drops um, towards the line about right here, inferior border as it comes back up. So all of this area is infraspinatus. We're taking a direct approach with our treatment here. And I'd recommend for a good bit of time, spend that time um, needling exactly like this, a direct approach. However, whenever we get to our lab, I will show and demonstrate how you can thread uh, the infraspinatus again, get a little bit more surface area as you treat that, that muscle uh, that, that seems to be so responsive uh, to treatment. But we'll look at that in the lab for now. Uh, just this simple one finger breadth below the spine of the scapula, dropping it anterior, posterior to anterior to get our, our desired benefit. So Terry's minor, important that you have to get very elevated into that, that, that area to get to that upper third, upper half to upper third of the scapula. Again, we, we see much similarity here as we do with latissimus. In fact, be told, we're also getting latissimus right here. So it's another twofer. When we look at... Um, Terry's major, Terry's major, very similar, except if you remember in our anatomy review, that is coming off of the distal half of, of the lateral aspect of the scapula. So we'll take that same approach. We're going to grasp that muscle tissue. We're going to bunch it together and needle it from off of the scapular, lateral scapular border from medial to lateral away from the rib cage. And again, we will catch latissimus here. Nothing wrong with that at all. And then slightly away from midline. So again, similar to serratus anterior, hand behind back or the hammerlock position, going to needle 
underneath the scapula to the anterior surface of of the, of the scapula. And the further that we can get to that mid surface of that, the better. Coming out right there into that location. All right, so when we go into the supine position, as, as we were discussing, uh, subscap comes around and, 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 and attaches onto or inserts onto the lesser tubercle. And so as we, if we elevate and extend, uh, that's gonna provide a nice location for it on the anterior aspect. definitely onto humerus as our backdrop. All right, so let's let's change our chair. Let's come back now to, all right. So we've talked about the treatment aspect uh, of all of these muscles, and we covered those in our uh, introductory material, uh, other than supraspinatus and subscap. Uh, now you can add those to your arsenal again with supraspinatus, cautious of not directing that needle anteriorly so that you end up in the lung field, uh, but use that technique of, of needling onto the spine of the scapula, rolling the skin forward uh, to come superior to inferior with a posterior angulation. Um, Terry's minor, Terry's major, subscap, again, the two locations either from in the hammerlock position to land on the anterior surface to get the, the muscle there along with, um, well, you'll, you'll get a little, you get catch some rhomboids, you'll also catch serratus anterior, or you can catch it on the anterior aspect. Here, we definitely want to be cautious. One of the reasons why we elevate is to move the uh, neurovascular bundle out of the way. So with that arm elevated, uh, we've just got a nice uh, approach to that scapula. And as you, as you put your subject in that position, you will be able to feel the border of that scapula and, and subscap will just pop right out there for you uh, to use as a, as a needling location. Moving into the upper arm again, I think we've covered all of these in our introductory material. Uh, coracobrachialis, biceps, brachii, brachialis, triceps. And again, I include brachioradialis because of its function at the, of the upper arm. Uh, the forearm muscles themselves don't really have any role but brachioradialis may have some. So because there's a small uh, contribution there. Um, corico and the biceps, the short head, uh, obviously attaching onto the coracoid process, uh, the long head of the biceps onto the superior glenoid uh, brachialis as a mover of the upper arm uh, needs to be included in the conversation. And then triceps with its attachment onto um, uh, the, the, the scapula itself. So let's move through these and let's go to our 3D anatomy. Let's come back here and we make this work. There we go. All right. Come back to the library. The upper arm. Okay. So muscles of the upper arm. Again, number one is the short head of the bicep and the coracobrachialis because of their role uh, with scapular stabilization with their attachment on the coracoid there. Uh, we definitely want to include that as a, a, a muscle or two muscles that could have an impact on the movement and stability of the shoulder joint uh, with the rotate a little bit. It's buried and hidden here. We'll get we'll see it later when we talk about the glenoid labrum. But the long head comes through the intertubercular groove as it comes over and attaches onto the superior aspect uh, with the labrum. And so those two pieces definitely come into play. Brachialis probably isn't directly involved, but, but because it is one of the larger movers of the upper arm, it can have a, an impact on what's happening at the shoulder. So as you look at a, a larger picture, you need to include brachialis in your treatment design. Um, as we look at triceps, so we do have a scapular attachment here to the, the long head. And so obviously that has an impact on, on the movement of the scapula, but because it also attaches two locations on the, on the humerus, 
um, need to be able to treat that as well. Obviously, if it attaches, it's going to play some sort of a role. And again, brachioradialis, eh, it's, a, it's a large mover of the forearm. May as well be able to include that in case there's something a little bit distally. I would like to say that dry needling is a very simple, straightforward approach. You put the needle in the one spot and everything is fixed. But what tends to happen is you, you treat, uh, they have some anterior pain. Let's say you go treat subscap. So subscap is going to come off the border. It's going to come over and attach onto the lesser tubercle. Very common to have this anterior pain right here. Well, here we have no fewer than two muscles. There's a bursa here. There's another bursa uh, on top of the subscapularis. So one, two, three, four, five. There are five structures very close that could be responsible for that anterior shoulder pain. So uh, just as an example, you need to be able to treat all of those in the event that just hitting one structure doesn't get what you want out of. Okay, so let's move back. So for treatment, let me drop all the way down. All right, let's move into our videos and look at our treatment here. Uh, coracobrachialis. So coracobrachialis can be treated in two approaches. Um, what I teach in the introductory course, um, I'm going to take from the lateral aspect. I take this lateral approach uh, because it stays away from the neurovascular bundle uh, up around the coracoid. Uh, this is a nice way to treat it. It is safe. Basically, we're going to find deltoid tubercle and we're going to needle just slightly anterior to that deltoid tubercle. Uh, that lets us get into the muscle belly of the coracobrachialis as it is starting to insert into the humerus. The second approach is off of the coracoid process itself. Uh, probably one finger breadth distal, maybe one, one half to one finger breadth lateral. And we'll drop that needle anterior to posterior. So here we look at the lateral approach. So I'm going to going to guide that needle in. I'm going to go just anterior to the humerus to land into the coracobrachialis. Obviously, I'm needling through other tissues as I do this. Proximity to the deltoid tubercle means I'm, I'm getting a little delt in there as well. Right there. And then the other is the, the anterior approach. So we're going to hit that coracoid. We're going to drop one finger breath distally and about a half to one finger breath laterally, anterior to posterior, slightly, okay, slightly superior to avoid that neurovascular bundle. And that's, that's, probably, the, that's probably the most effective way of treating coracobrachialis. I always want people to start treating it from the lateral aspect first, just to get comfortable with the technique. As you start exploring around the coraco, coracoid process itself, then definitely, yes, you can start needling off of that. So again, bicep short head, coracobrachialis off the lateral aspect of, of the coracoid process, and then peg minor off of that medial aspect. So biceps. So I'm going to, to again, we did this in introductory material. I start with a threading procedure through the biceps itself, and I do this to differentiate biceps brachii from brachialis. Um, so this method is going to show just needling from lateral to medial. When we're finished with that, then I'll tell you a more common approach. So we make sure that we're in that muscle belly, go lateral to medial and into that muscle belly itself. So probably more skin uh, contact, more surface area with this approach. That being said, just as common to see treatment from the anterior approach. So again, we're taking a midpoint between the elbow and the shoulder. So instead of from a lateral approach, I'm going to go uh, from the anterior and I'm going to needle through the biceps, through the brachialis, and I'm going to land on the humerus as my backdrop. So again, I do it that way and I get a twofer. But considering that I look at dry needling also as diagnostic, if I do from the lateral aspect, threading through both um, the biceps and I can drop further distally into brachialis. It lets me know exactly which my what my target tissues are.
again, brachialis, we're simply going to find the muscle bulk of the bicep. And then we're going to drop posteriorly off of that ropey structure that's right below it. And that's brachialis. So I've isolated biceps. I can feel that ropey structure below or posterior to it. And I'm going to needle through that into brachialis. It lets me delineate those two muscles. So for triceps, I'm, I'm utilizing one needle placement to affect the result on all three heads of the triceps. Uh, so I'm going to do it further distally, uh, closer to the elbow, uh, and we'll do a threading technique again. Okay, we're going to go just posterior to the humerus. Isolate that, that muscle belly and th thread through all three of the heads. So here, we'll, again, we'll, we'll do a simple threading maneuver uh, to get through that. So here we see we can do two approaches. We can thread through it, or we can do a direct approach all the way through. All right. I'm going to pause there. because We're going to move into the ligament structures now. So here we're going to look at um, the AC joint ligament, coracrochromial ligament, trapezoid, coracrohumeral, conoid, uh, muscles up around shoulder. Uh, then we'll look at the bursts of the subdeltoid, subacromial, those for impingement, and then the subtendinous bursa of infraspinatus and subscap, the coracobrachial bursa, and then lastly, the glenoid labrum. So let's jump into our complete anatomy again. All right. Let's bring that library up into our tendons and ligaments. So lots of tendons and ligaments to consider. Um, let's, don't move that. let's start with, let me get rid of all of these labels here. Clear those out. Very good. All right. So what we'll start with, um, and I'm going to be honest, I don't remember if we cover the SC joint here as well. I know we did in the um, advanced thoracic, uh, but there's always the, the anterior sternoclavicular ligament. We look further at it, it assists in uh, connecting clavicle to uh, the manubrium. Uh, laterally, we'll look at the AC joint. Uh, so we, we definitely have the ligament itself, but I hide that. And then we see further into that, then we have the articular disc of the AC joint. And so when we needle into that, we're gonna to want to make that as our target. So we come further, let's, let's continue exploring the ligaments of the, the shoulder here. So the first will be the coracoacromial ligament, uh, frequently dealing with uh, impingement, uh, rotator cuff interval problems, uh, that, that ligament uh, gets sacrificed uh, surgically, um, just because if it's inflamed, it's going to occupy some space and they need all the space they can get. So that's the coracoacromial coming off of the coracoid and landing onto the underside of um, the acromion. We'll then move to the trapezoid ligament, again, from the anterior medial surface of the uh, coracoid process, very close to where pec minor. Matter of fact, pec minor is going to attach inferior to, to 
first the trapezoid ligament, then second the conoid ligament that sits out here. Uh, trapezoid because it's got the two directional um, movement of fibers. Uh, and then let's move to move posteriorly to the conoid ligament. Again, it's going to come off of that medial surface of the coracoid process, landing a little bit more posteriorly uh, onto um, the clavicle. Again, all providing stability with the clavicle and the scapula. Superiorly, we have the coracohumeral ligament. And then anteriorly, these will be needled accidentally. We're not going to intentionally go after these, but as far as the anterior protection, they, the stability they give the, uh, the joint, the superior glenohumeral joint, middle glenohumeral ligament, and the inferior glenohumeral ligament. So a lot of the, the ligament is structures. So on the bursal piece, we also have, um, when, when we're evaluating shoulder problems, we're frequently going to find a pain in and dysfunction here. In the infraspinatus, a lot of times we'll feel it out here more commonly, or just as commonly, we feel it right at the at the angle or the angle here of the acromion, right in that joint space. And that is the subtendinous bursa of infraspinatus. Okay, we'll move from there and we'll look at the subdeltoid subacromial bursa. Again, if we're dealing with impingement, uh, these are going to going to definitely play a role. Uh, it shows it here as isolated and separate uh, bursa. Most commonly, those are joined as a single. They have a communication between each other. We also want to take a look at the tenosynovium. We'll look at this later, uh, but the intertubercular tendon sheath. So with intertubercular tenosynovitis, um, that can become a problem. We move further anteriorly and we will locate the coracobrachial bursa. So that separates, uh, creates, uh, allows for friction or frictionless movement um, uh, dealing with the coracobrachialis. We move from there anterior to the subscapularis, then we will find the subtendinous bursa of subscapularis. So we talked about having a lot of potential area for pain, dysfunction, tenderness, point tenderness in this anterior quadrant. Uh, again, we've got two muscles. We've got uh, on the anterior, off the coracoid, we've got the subscapularis deep, and then we've got these two bursa, any of which or multiple of which could become inflamed uh, with improper movement. So we've set up uh, treatment approaches where those can all be targeted and, and improved with, uh, with dry needling there. And I think that's all we're dealing with here. All right, so let's change our share. Let's move back to here. All right. So again, the AC joint ligament, um, here we are, here you can be seated or prone. Seated is usually the easiest way. Needle length is gonna be 10 to 15 millimeters. It's very small joint space. Uh, if, if there is any joint space, you may find clinically that you have to have the subject uh, hold their hand down, lean away to open that joint space up, or you could have them, you could push down on, on that um, uh, elbow joint to, to open that space up. Um, for a treatment, we're going we're gonna to identify our anterior and our posterior uh, V-notch right here. And that V-notch is going to tell us what the joint line is. Uh, running through that. We do that uh, right in the middle is going to be our AC joint. So we'll use a needle 10 to 15 millimeters. If while trying to get into this space, you hit a bony stop, you're just going to need to redirect and find uh, your path through there. I'm not concerned about uh, penetrating too deep. If we penetrate too deep, we're going to land in supraspinatus and it probably needs to be needled anyway. Uh, so this may take a couple of times uh, to get that joint space uh, open to let it get in there. If it is a uh, an AC joint that has previous injuries, lots of bone spur, a lot of spurring in that joint space, uh, we may find that it is fairly tight and we can't get a needle through. Uh, we do see good results with AC joint pain needling into uh, that joint space, into that disc. 
All right, let's go to 25. All right, so I've already done the, the talking here. Let's do I show, okay. All right, so I'm palpating, I'm, I'm locating that anterior, posterior V-notch, following the clavicle out laterally, where it attaches to the chromium, we'll get our anterior and our posterior location. We are simply going to drop that needle into the joint line between that anterior and posterior V notch. That tends to be a fairly responsive location. Again, the challenge is finding that sweet spot in between the clavicle and the chromium that will let you. Uh, enter into that space. All right. Sound quality is not great there. Let's move back to uh, here. We'll look at the coracoa chromial ligament. So here this is, is that anterior uh, ligament that comes from the coracoid over to the acromion. Again, it's a space-occupying ligament. If it's inflamed, it can be problematic. So my proposal is to needle that ligament, let it get some uh, some healing into that area, let it return to its normal function. Um, it definitely plays a role in stabilizing the glenohumeral joint, prevents superior dislocation. Um, here we'll be seated. Needle length is going to be two to three centimeters. And what we're going to do is we're going to identify uh, the anterior V-notch, and we're going to move one finger breath immediately along the clavicle. And then we're going to use the bracket method. We're going to retract the skin posteriorly, and we're going to needle it in a superior to inferior direction onto the anterior edge of the clavicle, similar to what we did for supraspinatus and subclavius. So we're going to needle down to that one finger breadth medially onto the clavicle. We're going to retract the needle. Then we're going to release the retracted skin to the allow the needle to proceed. And then we're going to drop it into a 15 to 20 degree posterior angulation uh, toward the humeral head. Now, it's a superficial ligament, so it shouldn't be any more than 20 millimeters. That's the wrong place. Let's try it there. All right, so I'm going to move way over here. So again, we're going to find anterior V-notch. We're going to move one finger breadth medially. We're going to drop down to the clavicle. We're going to retract the skin, drop down the clavicle, and then we're going to let it release and then drop down with a posterior angulation into that ligament. Again, really responsive ligament and frequently involved with shoulder dysfunction. All right. Okay, uh, the trapezoid ligament. So here that's further, this is on the anterior aspect, or I'm sorry, on the medial aspect of the coracoid as it travels back to, 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 to attach onto uh, the angle here of the lateral chromium. So in this case, again, we're gonna find this anterior V-notch and then we're gonna move two to th three finger breadths further medially. Uh, if you remember the other ligament, we've moved one. Here we're gonna go two to three. And here, We're going to proceed 15 to 20 degrees posterior angulation toward the coracoid process. So again, we're going to locate our, our two to three finger breaths, drop in an angle a little slightly posteriorly uh, to make certain that we get uh, good contact with that ligament. Okay, we're going to keep coming down. We just did that talking. So again, two to three finger breaths, and then we're going to drop it with a slight posterior angulation. So we locate that V-notch. So identify the superior inferior border of the clavicle, carry it all the way laterally. When you get as far as you can go, you land on that, that V-notch. Again, two to three finger breaths. It's going to be your needle placement and then slightly 
posterior. Get about two centimeters is going to be appropriate. You don't want to bury it all the way because there are some structures back there that we'd really like to stay away from. All right. Next will be the coracohumeral ligament. So here we're going to find, again, that anterior V-notch. As you can tell on these ligaments, these three, uh, anterior V-notch is our, is our guidepost. That, that's what we're looking for. Um, so here, um, we're going to, again, identify the anterior V-notch. We're going to needle from there just in a cranial to caudal direction with backdrop onto the humeral head. So we're not going to be overly concerned about angle or finger breaths one way or another. This one, we're simply going to just drop down onto um, that coracohumeral ligament. We'll find that in a moment is very similar to how we needle into um, the, the bursa of impingement. All right, so let's come back. All right. So again, we're going to come out way over here. Again, locate the, the anterior V-notch. And then from there, we're going to go completely superior to inferior to land on the glenohumeral ligament. A coracohumeral ligament. All right, so. Okay, that's it. Conoid ligament, uh, going to be more anterior. Here, we're going to use the posterior V-notch. And then we're going to move laterally th three finger breaths from there. Uh, we'll, we'll move the three finger breaths medially along the posterior clavicle. We're going to use a two finger bracket method to identify the posterior margin of the clavicle in this area. And then we're gonna insert the needle at about a 30 degree angulation to butt onto the posterior clavicle. So we want to land in the approximate area of, of the conoid ligament here. Uh, we can use a redirection then to fall off the inferior surface of the clavicle, clavicle and advance no more than one additional centimeter to reach that conoid ligament. So you can see its, its location. Uh, posterior V-notch, we're going to move three finger breaths. And from there, so here we'll be in a seated position. So follow the clavicle out, find that posterior V-notch. We're going to move those three finger breaths. About a 30 degree angulation, we're going to needle, land on the inferior surface of the clavicle, redirect into that. Just no more than one more centimeter onto the conoid ligament. So needling of the, the ligaments, we looked at the research earlier, um, it, needling of tendons uh, definitely shows some improvement. There's other research that indicates a similar response in tendons and ligaments. So if we can elicit a change in those structures uh, by needling them, um, then we can do some good benefit for our patient. All right. Now, muscles uh, are the structures of the bursa of impingement. Subdeltoid we'll look at first. Subacromial we'll look at second. Here you're going to be presented with a uh, methodology to needle both of them individually. What I will then teach you in our later lab session when we get to that is how to needle them simultaneously at the same time. So here, the subdeltoid uh, bursa, what we're going to do, we're going to palpate the lateral chromial border. Then one finger breath lateral, we're going to needle in a superior to inferior direction uh, to the humeral backdrop. Uh, we're going to retract the needle about a centimeter, and we're going to use a unidirectional rotation with a tinting manipulation to mobilize that bursa. So we're going to move, find that lateral border, uh, palpate out about a, about a finger breath, and then drop superior to inferior into that bursa, and then we can mobilize it. I haven't done that in a while. All right. So Again, I've already done the talking. Let's do some sticking.
Again, one finger Oops. breadth, lateral from that acromial border. So right there, subdeltoid. Very effective. Okay, we come back and look at the subacromial bursa. So here, we're going to find the lateral. Let's get to this here. So we're going to palpate the lateral acromial border. Uh, we're one finger breadth inferior. Then we're going to needle lateral to medial with a slight inferior angulation to roughly the midpoint of the shelf of the chromium using our unidirectional rotation with tinting mobilization. So we're going to find that and we're going to, we're going to move a little bit medi so inferior. So if we can drop down, so if we consider the skin overlying the deltoid is coming down here, we really want this line to be about one finger breadth inferior to here. And then we want to take uh, lateral to medial. My arrow is pointing at the, uh, the spot where we want to land, but this needle really should be coming more in the angle of this blue line right here. So we want to do the lateral medial to differentiate uh, subdeltoid from subacromial. Okay, we'll get to it again. We're going to do this in the seated position. Find that lateral acromial border. And again, drop one inferiorly. And here, you see, we're going to move lateral to medial to land in that subacromial space. As I mentioned, when we get into the advanced lab, the three-day lab, at the conclusion of the 16 lectures, I'll, I'll demonstrate a way to needle both of them at the same time. Basically, needling from through the subacromial, then through uh, I'm sorry, through the sub, through the subdeltoid first, through the subacromial, and then into the supraspinatus itself. Uh, so we get we get the deltoid, we get the two bursa, and we get the supraspinatus all in one suite. So there we get a forfer. All right. So let's come back here. Then the subtendinous bursa of infraspinatus. Uh, again, this is that posterior. Uh, location that we feel. So we needled this. Uh, we're, there's several things that we could be hitting. We definitely know we're going to hit infraspinatus in this area. We definitely know we're going to catch that posterior capsule. Uh, we very well may hit teres minor. We will hit subtendinous bursa. And depending on our placement, we may even hit the glenoid labrum. So here, um, our, our, our procedure, we're going to palpate the acromial angle at the posterior border of the chromium. And we're gonna move two finger breaths inferior from that point. And then we're gonna needle posterior to anterior to land on the posterior joint capsule. And we will use a unidirectional rotation with a tenting manipulation. So that posterior angle right there, the acromial angle, we'll drop the two finger breaths and posterior to anterior. All right, we've talked, let's move all the way to the doing. Come down that two finger breaths, posterior to anterior. And I'm gonna land on lots of, lots of good structures right there. Very responsive. Right there. Okay, now let's move to okay, the coracobrachial bursa. So this is the superficial more of the two bursa that we'll see on the anterior side. Uh, it sits um, uh, deep to the tendinous origin of the coracobrachialis muscle. Uh, it often communicates with the subtendinous bursa of subscapularis, which we'll look at in a moment. There can be a communication right there. And again, any bursa permits free friction uh, friction-free movement between, uh, here in this case, tendon of the coracobrachialis muscle and the coracoid process. So just to play. So that being said, at bursa, we have an abnormal movement. We have some sort of mechanical defect in, in what's happening. Maybe there's a strength imbalance, anterior to posterior, superior to inferior. Uh, that bursa, if it gets inflamed, then it's going to create issue. So this is a nice approach to needle that. 
Here, we're going to find uh, the coracoid process of the scapula. We're going to drop one finger breadth inferior from that location, and we're going to needle an anterior to posterior angulation by a slightly laterally uh, using unidirectional rotation. Uh, disgust, and there you can see it three dimensionally sitting right behind uh, the coracobrachialis there. Again, we're going to drop one finger breadth from the coracoid process and then anterior to posterior, slightly lateral. So find that coracoid. We're going to drop one finger breadth, needle location, needle placement, and then we're going to go slightly lateral. for the corcobrachial bursa. All right. Then to the subtendinous bursa of subscapularis. So this is the one that sits deeper, deeper, a little bit more inferior. And it's the one that allows uh, friction-free movement between the tendon of subscap and the coracoid process, as well as the scapular neck. Our procedure here from the coracoid process, we're going to, um, Drop two finger breaths inferior from that location. You're going to needle anterior to posterior, bias slightly medially. So with uh, coracobrachial bursa, it was one finger breadth below, anterior posterior slightly lateral. Here it's going to be two finger breaths below uh, uh, coracoid, and it's going to be slightly medial to make sure we land there. This one will also correlate very closely to the anterior glenoid labrum. So again, we look at that. Again, two finger breaths distal from or caudal from the coracoid process with a slightly medial angulation. So locate that coracoid. Okay, here we're going to move two finger breaths medially, uh, inferiorly with a slight medial angulation. And so that you know, yes, that is the location of that bursa, but also the location of the anterior glenoid labrum. So before we get to actually showing that, let's come back one more time here to the glenoid labrum. So what it does, it forms the lip around the glenoid fossa. Um, its attachment to the glenoid fossa strengthens superiorly with, where it blends with the fasciculi, the tendon of the long head of the biceps. So uh, anytime we're talking about a slab repair, uh, we definitely know that we're dealing with the labrum tearing up here. And then post-surgically, that's why we don't load that bicep down uh, so we don't uh, further risk detaching that. Uh, again, it um, uh, forms a rim around the glenoid fossa, deepening the cavity form a socket for the humeral head. And it, and it may assist in stabilizing the humeral head. Typically, it just is a problem if it starts to get frayed and we have tearing. Uh, so uh, here, again, we're going to be seated. This one, we're going to needle from a superior aspect. So we're going to palpate and locate the posterior V-notch of the clavicle and the acromion. From the medial border of the V-notch, we're going to move one finger breadth further medial, medially. And here, we're going to insert the needle in this location. We're going to advance from superior to inferior. The angulation is slightly lateral and anterior to land on the glenoid labrum. So uh, this, this can be a challenging needle depending on a patient's uh, morphology. Uh, but if you come back away from this V-notch, one finger breadth, and you needle from superior to inferior with, with an anterior and lateral angulation, you will drop onto glenoid labrum. This Needling of the glenoid labrum was developed after dealing with my own shoulder issues. I have labral problems myself. Uh, needling that structure can provide significant relief. Um, okay, so okay, so the glenoid labrum, we have three approaches. That's the first. The second is to deal with the, the posterior um, glenoid labrum. 
So here again, we're going to find uh, the acromial angle. We're going to drop one finger breadth inferior, one finger breadth medially. And then we're going to needle lateral to medial with a slightly inferior angulation at that point, land on the posterior glenoid labrum. You may remember the subtendinous bursa of infraspinatus. You can see that it's in a hidden mode, but this is going to land just anterior or just medially to where we needled for that. So that we would have dropped uh, one to two finger breadths to needle here. For the posterior labrum, we're going to drop one and then go medially one and needle anterior to posterior, slightly medial. And then for the anterior, so here, uh, again, we're going to palpate coracoid process of the scapula. We're going to drop one finger breadth inferior from that location, needle uh, anterior to uh, anterior posterior by a slightly laterally to land on the glenoid labrum. So again, we, we saw this when we were needling uh, coracobrachial bursa. Same needle placement and location. All right, let's look at those together. Through that, okay. So we're gonna start with the superior. Again, posterior V-notch, one finger breadth, um, medially and, and needle, superior to inferior, laterally and anteriorly. Anterior to land on the glenoid labrum or using unidirectional rotation. And I'm going to come out, follow the clavicle, find that posterior V notch, which that is going to sit right above supraspinatus in that location. So we're going to needle one finger breadth back. We're going to drop needle there and we're going to angle lateral and anterior to land onto the glenoid labrum. Very powerful stick. Get a chromial angle, one finger breath down, one finger breath medially. Drop that needle, slightly medial, medial angulation, land on posterior glenoid labrum. Okay, so I don't demonstrate the video here. The same as the coracobrachial bursa. Uh, again, that one finger breath down, needle anterior, posterior uh, to land on glenoid labrum. All right, let's move now uh, back to. All right, so our regional diagnosis protocols. Uh, here, uh, what, we, what we will see clinically is rarely we just have a dysfunction in one muscle or two muscles. Usually it's a system of, of problems that we're dealing with. Uh, the AC joint, probably one of the fewer issues we deal with uh, as far as complexity. It's usually an overuse uh, problem or, or, or degenerative process because of trauma, um, similar with the SC joint. Uh, frequently, we deal with rotator cuff problems, whether it's pre-surgical, occasionally it's post-surgical. Uh, kneeling into the four muscles themselves can provide benefit. If we're dealing with tendonitis out at the attachment on the uh, greater tubercle, we need to be able to needle into those as well. Uh, subdeltoid, sub AC bursitis, the impingement syndrome, uh, really nice protocol for dealing with that there. Um, what I didn't include here was glenoid pain. Um, glenoid is one of those that can be an add on to any of these. Uh, anything around the shoulder could have a labral component to it. So we add that uh, as an add on. Um, intertubercular tenosynovitis, probably not that common, but do want to be able to identify it 
in that intertubercular groove so that we can needle that. And uh, I'll discuss it uh, and we'll definitely uh, go over a demonstration of how to do that in our final lab. Uh, then we'll look at the six scapula or scapular dyskinesis, snapping scapula, wing scapula, uh, Springle's shoulders here. I decided not to include that. That's fairly complex uh, pediatric um, problem. And I don't know as dry needling would actually be that beneficial uh, given the, the nature of the condition. So for the AC joint here, um, are structures that we're going to be concerned with are the distal end of the clavicle, the acromion, the articular disc, and then the acromioclavicular ligament. We can be seated or prone. Seated is probably more preferable. Uh, very similar to what we did. Um, moved here to the first uh, slide here. Uh, our first structures are, are going to literally be just uh, that AC joint space. We'll hit the ligament. We'll hit the articular disc. Uh, that's always my go-to first. Uh, secondarily, if I'm not seeing... Uh, any, any changes in what I want to do, then I'll hit the distal end of the clavicle and onto the acromion. Um, and lastly, I will hit subcutaneous acromial bursa. So we probably will hit it as we get on either side of, of the clavicle itself. Or the intention here is to needle a connective tissue from this ligament as they are moving further to attach uh, onto uh, either the clavicle or acromion. Uh, the tertiary here is be specific into the subacromial bursa. With that, we would definitely want to do some uh, unidirectional tinting, some, some bursal mobilization. Uh, we could do, because of uh, orientation out here, we could hit uh, the, the suprascapular and the lateral pectoral nerve, C5, C6, C6, and 7 of the brachial plexus. Um, and so there's a big uh, depth of, of how to do that, but we've already gone through the AC joint. So that is the, the challenge, uh, actually getting into that space and then throwing these add-ons on top if you're not getting the response that you need. Uh, more medial, and then these two lateral are the one that if you're gonna to needle into that bursa. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we have to look at that in 3D anatomy because we've already looked at that. For the rotator cuff itself, uh, again, we're going to target the four muscles of the rotator cuff. If there's a muscle imbalance, if there's a sprain, uh, if there's uh, a, an issue with, with the muscle just not working right or excessive pain, either in the superior, posterior, lateral, anterior, uh, this will let you deal with all of it. Rarely will I needle uh, just one muscle of the rotator cuff. Typically, our primary location dealing with rotator cuff problem is going to be supra and infra. Uh, again, we talked about how to needle into safely into the supraspinatus uh, and just a further, a little bit further caudally into the infraspinatus to elicit the change in that muscle. Secondary location, I would go ahead and hit subscap and teres minor. Subscap from a, a hand behind back or the hammerlock position to land on the anterior surface. And then teres minor on the superior um, half to third of the lateral border of the scapula. Um, if there is a rotator cuff problem, better not work, forget about deltoid. Deltoid is going to be playing a role. Uh, so anterior, lateral, po uh, posterior, anterior, posterior, or lateral. And because of its location onto uh, the uh, coracoid process, want to throw that short head of the biceps in there as well. Again, I mentioned that any sort of pain dysfunction in that shoulder could have a labral component. So if I needle these once and I don't get the response that I'm looking for, or I go through each of my uh, locations, then I may consider throwing the glenoid labrum on. That would also be dependent on uh, possibly a, uh, a grind test, uh, a clunk test, some sort of a test that tells me that there's something going on with that labrum. Uh, could also come back and hit uh, in the spinal segmental locations, C5, C6, C7, if you recognize those are our multifidus, our deep uh, muscles. Um, uh, here we have spinalis capitis coming off, um, or spinalis services coming off, and it's hidden. Uh, so those those could play a role as well. Okay, for the the tendonitis or the tendon tendinosis pieces that's frequently involved. So if we deal with this neuromuscular dysfunction in these muscles long enough, if it sits on, if it starts becoming more chronic, then we will start seeing. Um, uh, 
tendinosis out in the tendons themselves. They're not long tendons. The myotendinous junction is fairly quick, fairly narrow. Um, again, treatment approach, let's hit, hit the muscles themselves first. Supra, infra, secondary, teres minor, subscap. Lastly, we want to get very close into their tendinous attachments. And so if there is some uh, tendinosis, if there's some small uh, tearing uh, of these tendons, uh, they will be uh, tender. So a key note of uh, anterior to um, the long head of the biceps, that's where you'll find um, subscap. And then there's a superior, middle, and inferior facet of the greater tubercle. And that'll be the insertion location of the other supra, infra, and teres. So just slightly medial from that attachment is where we would drop our needles into those tendinous structures. If that is going on, you'll definitely, as you palpate uh, the location, you'll definitely get a positive response from the patient. That would be a good indication tertiarily now to needle into those structures. Uh, again, we could come back C5, C6, C7 uh, to get that spinal segmental, uh, getting a change uh, in, in the central system can also be helpful to what's uh, happening, what's functioning uh, uh, distally. We look at bicipital tendonitis, and here we'll, we'll discuss that in a, both a proximal and a distal or an origin and insertion uh, approach. Uh, for the origin, first we want to hit the bicipital tendons. Uh, so for uh, short head, we're going to come right off the coracoid process. We want to needle into that. Let's elicit that 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 change. Let's uh, facilitate uh, that um, that response. Uh, similar in the intertubercular groove, we'll want to hit the, the, the long head. Uh, see if we can have a change there. Uh, in that case, we'll get to it in just a bit. Uh, we may want to look and see if we have more of a case of tenosynovitis in that area, in which case there's a different approach for that that we'll look at. Our secondary location for, uh, uh, for this uh, at the origin is looking at the heads themselves. So we'll drop about three finger breaths distally and before they become a common belly, we'll, we'll needle into each of the bellies of short head and long head. Finally, we'll needle into the, the belly of the, the biceps itself. So I've got the point here. As we've talked about a moment ago, we can differentiate biceps from brachialis by doing a, a lateral to medial thread. In this case, you can do that lateral medial thread, or you can do anterior to posterior landing on the humerus as your backdrop, but the biceps muscle belly. And then Finally, we can look at our spinal segmental locations at C5, C6. Um, for a peri-epineural location, we could look at needling for the musculocutaneous nerve. Uh, it's distal at uh, the, the break between biceps and the brachialis. Uh, we will cover that more when we get to uh, our next lecture, which is uh, advanced right needling of the elbow. Uh, so that, that can be an add-on piece there. If we look at its insertion, here we'll look at um, the distal aspect. So primary location is just into the tendon itself. We'll, we'll go after that and we can needle straight into that tissue. If there are, uh, so our secondary location, again, we're gonna go up the chain. Here we would look at the bicep belly itself. Again, we can do an anterior to posterior or lateral to medial approach. And then third, the, sh the, the short and long head of the bicep. Let's differentiate those. Let's make sure we cover both of those to address any sort of neuromuscular dysfunction that's taking place there. Spinal segmental locations, again, we can look at C5, C6 to see if we can elicit a change there. In this case, we could also look, again, uh, at the musculocutaneous nerve. Again, it's going to be distally uh, between biceps and brachialis. For subdeltoid subacromial bursitis, or more commonly impingement, our primary location is going to be our subdeltoid and our subacromial bursa. So we went through the protocol for dropping off of the acromion down one uh, finger breadth and then lateral to medial for subacromial. For subdeltoid, we came out laterally a finger breadth and then dropped anterior, I'm sorry, superior to inferior to land on um, a subdeltoid bursa. Again, we get to lab, I'll demonstrate how to do this with a single needle stick. Uh, then we wanna look at uh, the deltoid further laterally here. And then we wanna get infraspinatus, the, those two main power uh, muscles of, of that structure. 
Lastly, we want to catch uh, peg major, uh, biceps, short head, and coracobrachialis. All structures that are, if, if they've got an excessive amount of muscle tone, are going to be compacting that, uh, that head of the humerus into the glenoid, but also pulling it superiorly into the, the acromion. Uh, da, 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 was that in there? Yes, it was. Okay. And that's impingement. So intertubercular tenosynovitis. This is easier to demonstrate than it is to, to describe, uh, but, but we'll make our best effort. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to drop a, um, a primary location is going to be a, the synovial sheath between the tubercles. So what we're going to do is one thumb breadth um, above and below that sheath. Our secondary is we want to do the long head of the biceps. So our procedure is we're going to palpate between the greater lesser tubercle. Uh, we're going to use internal external rotation to define that of the shoulder. Uh, we're going to needle at the superior most aspects that you can define the groove. And then we're going to go one finger breadth, could be finger, could be thumb, between a finger and a thumb breadth distally. So these angles are going to be either perpendicular. What I really like to do is direct those needles slightly toward each other. And what we're going to do is we're going to use some unidirectional rotation. We're going to tent those uh, two needles, and then we're going to rock those needles back and forth. So we're basically going to floss that tendon through that synovium. Goal is to one, elicit the, uh, the, the, the response to, to heal that area, get some, some, some good changes there. But two, if we can physically move that tendon inside that synovium, then we could make that change that we're looking for there. Finally, let's look at our um, scapular um, problems. Here, I do want to jump over to our, our complete anatomy to look at that. So with our scapular problems, on all three, most of the same muscles are involved. It just comes down to what order you want to have your primary treatment. So the muscle, the stabilizing and moving muscles of the scapula, as you can tell, rhomboid major, minor, levator, serratus anterior, pec minor, uh, short head of biceps, coracobrachialis. Um, Terry's major, minor, don't know if I said those. And then also the traps. Uh, so all of these muscles play an important role in, in stabilization of the scapula. In these next three protocols, uh, we'll, we'll isolate what to do first, what to do second, and what to do third. But all of these structures are going to be the important things to focus on. All right. So for sick scapula, sick means, uh, see, it was originally termed by Burkhart. Uh, scapular malpositioning, inferior medial border prominence, coracoid pain and malposition, and dyskinesis of scapular movement. And basically, yes, it's an overuse syndrome. So what, what we want to start with, um, with that. Ah, it's doing this thing. I'm going to try to get back to this. It's a programming issue I didn't change. So in order, pec minor. Uh, all right, you're going to bear with me here. So pec minor, bicep, short head, and coracobrachialis. So all of those anterior structures there. Our secondary, I'm going to come back. I apologize for this. Levator, rhomboids, and serratus. Those are our secondary, tertiary, teres, get back. Matter of fact, I'm going to, that's going to get frustrating. Let's jump from there to here. All right, let's get all the way down here. Okay, so uh, peg minor. By a short head of biceps and then coracobrachialis, uh, because they have all of that anterior inferior pull. 
Okay, our second uh, is levator, um, rhomboids and serratus anterior. So they can they can also play a role in in pulling uh, superiorly and anteriorly, probably more superiorly. Uh, so that, that the rhomboids especially can affect the rotation. And then finally, teres major minor, lats and trapezius, which is all of the posterior support uh, to that structure. So kneeling in that that um, sequence uh, is the approach for the six scapular, scapular dyskinesis. Okay, we move on to the snapping scapula. So the snapping scapula is, so it's a man it's manifest as an audible or palpable crackling during the sliding movements of the scapula over the rib cage. So we, we've had, well had these patients who raise that shoulder blade up and down and it's cracking and it's popping up there and, and, and your patients are really confused on on why it's doing that. Is it arthritis? Is it bone spurs? Well, no, it's, it's a snapping scapula. It's a scapular issue. Uh, and, and it's by imbalance of the muscles of scapular stabilization. So with that, I've got it all right here. So our first location, levator scap, rhomboids, and serratus anterior. So these things are staying super tight and this superior angle is just staying, it, it's grinding basically into that posterior rib cage. So the solution is reduce that muscle tone in that area. Let's get those muscles lengthened back out. A lot of scapular mobilization will be necessary, but those are our, our first structures to, to address there. Secondarily, we need to hit pec major, I mean, sorry, pec minor, biceps, coracobrachialis uh, to let that, so it's pulling it, it's pulling it superiorly and anteriorly. We've got to release that anterior as well to let that, that, that scapula come back more to a, a neutral position. Lastly, we'll hit teres major, minor, latissimus, and trapezius. Those are the posterior control muscles. So for whatever reason, they're not doing their job in keeping that muscle or that, that scapula in the proper position. Uh, and so uh, restoring normal movement in through all of those structures, definitely you want to palpate and see which one is your offending. Odds are it's going to be levator, rhomboids, or serratus. And so we, we want to get that back to proper function, get them on an HEP to get that moving right. And we hit those. Okay, and then finally, the winged scapula. So this could be uh, from a um, long thoracic nerve. This could be uh, trauma of some type. Uh, but we've all seen this patient with, with that piece that's just not, you got that massive wing. Occasionally, it can be bilateral, uh, indicates a weakness uh, or a lack of um, neuromuscular contraction, uh, serratus anterior, a couple of others. Uh, so where we start here, dry needling, again, serratus anterior, the rhomboids, and trapezius. Uh, we've got to get those strengthened. So you want to needle them to stimulate them and then start them on that ATP to work on strengthening um, those muscles. Uh, our secondary locations, we move into pec, uh, pec minor and levator scap. And then lastly, bicep short head and latissimus. So that is the sequence for dealing with um, the wing scapula, odds are you're going to see results dealing with uh, just the primary locations. And then lastly, let's look at, there's only one perineural protocol we'll look at here. It's the supraclavicular nerve, which gives us a lot of this um, pain in the side of the neck and then laterally out here. If we've looked at it and we've addressed scalenes, we've looked at, the, at all of these different things and nothing is responding, then we may want to consider that we could have an entrapment of, of the supraclavicular nerve, either as it exits the neck or further out laterally, either above or below the clavicle. Um, let's see here. So here, uh, my God, I do have, all right. So our primary uh, neural locations, we're gonna, gonna come into the lateral third of the, of the upper trapezius. Um, so right out here, we're then gonna move into the in inferior of the clavicle and the anterior deltoid. And then we'll move further medially inferior to the clavicle at the clavicular portion of pec major. So here from a muscular standpoint, we're gonna hit the distal, the more lateral, um, pieces of that supraclavicular nerve. Again, superficial, 1.5 centimeters is more than enough. Um, secondarily, we'll look at splenius services, splenius capitis. So 
Although our issue is here, we know that's happening because of that muscle tension, that tightness or that shortening of those muscles. So you'll recognize these as our, as our C6 and as our T4, dropping deep into the multifidus, catching uh, splenius surfaces as we're coming here, and then capitis, or capitis and then surfaces as we run down to T4. So that's our secondary. Uh, for our spinal segmental locations, we could look at C3, C4. Uh, let me see if I've got that pulled up here in my library. Uh, I do not. So that picture will, will suffice us there. So that takes us through our, our muscular pieces, pieces that aren't directly related to the shoulder, that anterior torso, that cervical thoracic junction, anterior posterior muscles, which are the muscles of scapular control. Then we looked at the muscles of the, the shoulder itself, the deltoid, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres major, I'm uh, sorry, teres minor, subscap, we included teres major in for the rotator uh, the shoulder itself, although not part of the rotator. Then we looked at the ligamentous structures, both ligaments in and around the shoulder. And but well, before I do that, we also looked at the muscles of the forearm. Have to consider the muscles of the forearm if we're going to consider the shoulder. Likewise, we didn't talk about the cervical spine. We have to look at the cervical spine, the CT junction, the, the articular components themselves if we're going to address the shoulder. Um, tendons and ligaments, we looked at lots of tendons in and around the shoulder. We looked at a lot of bursa. Uh, bursa in the shoulder frequently inflamed with movement because of the amount of movement we see there. And then lastly, we looked at the, the perineural protocol, the main one that's really associated with that upper extremity, uh, with, with the shoulder itself. So we, we move from there. Um, next thing, let me get all the way past here. And then we finally get to what we've all been waiting for is our post-lecture assignment. So I'm making it super easy here. Uh, for your post-lecture assignment, if a patient presents with anterior shoulder pain, what are six potential structures that could be involved and that might benefit, bring that back up, and it might benefit from dry needling? Uh, six is a lot, and um, it could be anything. I want you to just think of six of them that could be. Uh, just let me know. Again, we're going to go easy here. For our next assignment, our next assignment, our next lecture is going to be on July 26th. Uh, that's a Monday, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, there is a lot more uh, content as relates to relates to uh, the nerves, uh, the perineural protocols, uh, and the elbow. So uh, review the information from tonight's lecture. Uh, post your response in uh, the, the the dry needling arena. And if you have questions, feel free to yell. Otherwise, uh, we will see you on 726 for lecture number nine. So lecture number nine starts the back half. You're halfway finished. We're on the downhill swing. All right. Any questions, email me, send me a message.